So thanks for joining to listen to me the chapter 1.3 regarding crystal structure determination and the part two. And of course, the course is solid state physics. So what we will do here on this part is that they will start going through the mathematical treatment that shows us the general diffraction theory. So basically, we're going to go through a so-called Laue description of X-ray diffraction, and, and we will develop the needed mathematics to understand how X-ray diffraction works in practice in the more general case. I will warn you that there will be quite a bit of math on the way, but hopefully you will also appreciate the insights the mathematical treatment provides to us. So this is we, we slightly go beyond Hoffman's book in the mathematical treatment, but I felt that it's absolutely necessary for us to look more into the details because that's where the intuition and insights arise from the mathematics, or at least, at least that's what I personally think as a physicist. So I felt that uh, we must go there on our course, that we cannot avoid uh, the necessary mathematics. Then we learn that now we also must introduce to you the reciprocal lattice. So that concept will be defined in the chapter 1.3.5. And there we go through the main definitions and the main properties that are related to this infamous reciprocal lattice. So we will learn that there's a thing similar to the original uh, lattice vector R, capital R. And then there's a similar reciprocal lattice vector and then we will go through its definition and, and its main properties in that subchapter. And then finally, in, in our final uh, part of this lecture, we will go through the meaning of the reciprocal lattice. So there we'll essentially discuss the meaning of the reciprocal lattice. And I, I try my best to elucidate to you why it's really a big deal in solid state physics. And there, that's also the part where we start first speaking of lattice periodic functions. And, and that's where we kind of like start putting into use the concepts we, we started to, to use in our first chapter 1.1 regarding the general mathematical description of crystalline structures. So that what we that's our outline for this lecture, the second part on, on 1.3. And I will then not just start our treatment. So we are now first like reminding to you that the Bragg theory that we have discussed so far, it has its limitations. And, and the main limitation that it is, because it's a very simple treatment, is that it doesn't provide access to the information related to the basis of the lattice. And um, most of the atomic structures, the crystalline structures that we have, they actually do have something in the basis of the lattice and not just a single individual atoms. Then, then we see that the Bragg theory is just too limited to be of any use in practice. Physically, it's also obscure what those planes really are since we know that we're dealing with a atomic lattice. So these are the kind of main disadvantages related to the Bragg theory. And what we will do here next is that we, we start extending our treatment to the Laue description. And, and really the pioneering work was done by Max von Laue. And, and he, he was awarded for a Nobel Prize more than a century ago. <clears throat> Before we get started, I would like to say a, a few words regarding the kind of so-called sweet spot of, of uh, usable X-ray wavelengths. And, and this is what we will do first to kind of like uh, get things going. So we estimate the range of usable X-ray wavelengths that we can use. And the upper limit, of course, like uh, we get that from the lattice constants associated with typical crystals. And, and that gave us that the, the lattice constant, usually there are on the order of like less than 5 nanometers or on the Ångström scale. That tells to us that then, then we must have the wavelength of an X-ray smaller than 2 times t. That's what we got from the Bragg condition. And then we see that they, we should have wavelengths that are less than 10 nanometers. So that's the upper limit. And one could then ask also that uh, is there a lower limit of, of using photons and, and electrons? And especially for photons, the lower, lower limit arises from the phenomenon of a pair production. And then let me just outline what was a pair production. We all know this, but we have maybe forgotten. So we have a gamma ray or X-ray, depending on the type of a origin of the photon, 
it might have the same energy but we might call it either a gamma ray or an x-ray depending is it rising from a, a, a transitions in the nucleus or is the origin of, of uh, photons is it um, originated in the electron transitions so the core electrons so uh, basically in pair production a, a, a gamma ray or an x-ray spontaneously forms an electron and its antiparticle positron and this pair production starts occurring when we have energetic enough uh, x-rays or gamma rays so in, in practice when lambda is, is smaller than 1.022 mega electron volts which is uh, like a, it's a large value of energy that's that's when we can still avoid pair production and that gives us the lower limit of, of x-rays so 0 0.012 nanometers is roughly the kind of lower limit threshold that we should not go over and, and this then gives us the sweet spot for usable x-ray wavelengths so we should be somewhere between 0 0.01 nanometers and 10 nanometers in the usable wavelength range and then and, and this is what we should be using and, and this is also something that they, uh, affects the, the kind of achievable resolution which is maybe something that it's good for you to know but uh, in, in the kind of scope of this course we don't really need to care about those details but at least in practice like this of course does limit things and now we just start going start the mathematical treatment that we are going to develop develop next and what we do is that we assume that we are dealing with time harmonic incident plane waves so the, this is the kind of assumption we always want to do and now i'm using this this uh, calligraphic e to note that this is not energy but this is in fact the, the amplitude the complex amplitude of, of my plane wave so and an ink as a sample index means that it's an incident plane wave and it's a function of uh, position r and, and time t and, and the simplest form is that they, it has its uh, modulus it's at its amplitude e naught and then we have the plane wave component propagating in the k direction k is our wave vector and then it's harmonic plane wave so oscillating at the angular frequency of omega so this this then gives me the kind of a direction where the plane wave is going and k is the wave vector and, and its amplitude is 2 pi per lambda and in vacuum and, and if it would be in media which in fact in x-ray diffractions we often are not in practice we are not so we don't need to care about the 2 pi n times lambda so divided by lambda definition in a medium but it's, this is enough that the 2 pi per lambda in, in free space in, in vacuum k points along the direction of propagation and r is the point in the sample and omega is the angular frequency so this is like highlighted here in the figure and what's happening roughly we have an incident plane uh, uh röntgen ray it's coming at the uh, k way in the direction of k and it's hitting our sample and, and with the black dots i'm trying to show you that it's a periodic structure please note that here we are using a complex notation for the electric field e and, and of course in most general case it's a vector so that the, the, the field can oscillate in, in some direction also in addition to its propagation direction and, and strictly speaking field electric field is a real valued quantity because if you recall it it's defined through the Lorentz force so f equals charge of our charged particle times the electric field plus q times velocity of the charged particle v uh, and the cross product with the magnetic field so this is a, a Lorentz force and, and this is a defining equation that defines us what is the, the electric field and, and what's the magnetic field so how they uh, change the trajectory and, and movement velocity of a charged particle and we certainly know that the force is a real valued quantity so then we also must have real valued quantity on the right hand side of the equality so we know that the, the in, in real space description the electric field and the magnetic field they must be real valued quantities but we often just like forget this fact and are perfectly happy with complex valued field quantities and there the complex valuedness what it means that just tells us kind of like relative phase difference 
with respect to some other plane wave, for example. So he hide uh, phase information into the fact that we are dealing with complex valued numbers. <clears throat> Instead of fields, what we will measure in, in practical experiments is that we measure the intensities or irradiances to be more precise. And in practice, those are measured so that they, what we actually measure is that we measure the modular square of our incident field. And since we're dealing with a plane wave, like uh, the modular squaring, what it does is that the exponent vanishes. And, and we know that we actually are measuring something that is proportional to the modular square of our plane wave's amplitude, E0. And then what we further assume is that the we, we are scattering fields, so that the, the scatter field is denoted with E sca scattered field, and it's detected far away from the sample in a direction of K prime. And then that they, well, where we are detecting is that they, we are using a point capital R prime as notation of that. And now you can see that that's highlighted in the figure already. So the scattering field propagates also like a plane wave and, and in a different direction. And the direction is defined, defined by K prime. And for the rest of the treatment, we are perfectly happy in, in forgetting the time dependence of our incident field. When we are considering normal conventional X-ray diffraction, so that we do not want to excite, for example, phonons in our lattice, we, we, we don't need to care about the time dependence. It, it doesn't matter here. And, and we, don't, we don't treat it. But if you would be really intrigued, like, uh, of course, we could get access to, to more richer information of the lattice and its properties if it would also like uh, take use of, of not time harmonic fields. So we could, for example, see that the, some of the energy would be lost all along the way during the scattering process, and that would imply to us that there, there's some kind of uh, creatures that are, are like uh, absorbing light. I and mean, sometimes, for example, that would provide access of lattice vibrations, phonons, some other time, if we would be dealing with magnetic materials and, and, and magnetism would be our, our like a field of interest, we would might be able to probe magnons, which are kind of quantized uh, magnetic uh, uh, oscillations uh, in the system. But but we don't need to go there. That that's way beyond our current scope in this course. But if you're interested, uh, Kittle's book is speaking about those for sure. Like uh, Kittle's book is speaking a lot of things and saying a lot of things. So I recommend to look into that and, and, and leave Hoffman for, 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 for other purposes. I, I, I disapprove Hoffman's book. Uh, my apologies for that. But I prefer more, more mathematical mathematically advanced textbooks because to me it's it's a mathematics that tells me what happens and this is incidentally by the re reason why I, I had to write the booklet on this course because the, the kind of official course course book of, of Hoffman's was not really like satisfactory for these purposes that we had what we do next is that they, we now take the scatter field and, and we consider that to be originated from a small volume dv from the sample and, and we assume that it will be of the form that the scattered field like is also a plane wave so it has its scattering amplitude e scat naught and, and then we have the plane wave propagating in the direction dictated by k prime and now uh, the coordinate is being given by capital r minus r because it's, it's coming from a small volume inside the sample and then here we just Say that the, the E scat north 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 is the, the scattering amplitude that we want to determine because that will then tell us information of the structure of the solid. And what we do next, and, and this thing takes a little bit of, of thinking and convincing, but we assume that the scattered amplitude is proportional to uh, the incident field. And, and this, I guess, is not a surprise. But we, we are also now saying that the, the scatter field amplitude is proportional to a term rho, which this, this rho is, is uh, our uh, electron density or, or proportional to the electron density in our material. 
So we, we assume that it's in fact the electrons that are giving rise to the scattering of Röntgen rays or the, the electron concentration. And, and this is in fact the quantity that we, we really are interested in solving in an understanding this role. And, and this is what we will be looking next, that how we can gather information of this, how it actually looks like. <clears throat> so what we have now is that the, we can now use the, 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 the form. We have assumed our scattered field is, and now it turns into that the, the scattered field at the location of capital R prime is proportional to the incident field times the electron density times the, the plane wave uh, component. So the, the field is propagating in the K prime direction. And, and we know that this is then proportional, that the incident field is proportional to the exponent ik uh, dot r term, that the, we have the proportionality, that the scattered field is proportional to the exponent ikr times the, the electron density times the, the electron exponent ik prime times r prime minus r. And, and then we can, we can shuffle the terms a little bit so that we get the equality that the, on, on the first term we have exponent i k prime dot product with the capital R prime times the, the electron density rho times exponent k minus k prime times r. And now we can start doing physics. We are far away from the sample and, and that's what we can assume by, by just coming up with the proper kind of x-ray diffraction experiment. And then this implies that the first term, the exponent i k prime times r prime, is a constant valued. And, and this we can then, then neglect in our analysis. And this is what we will do next. So total scatter field due to the whole sample volume v is now, and, and now we must integrate over the whole sample so that we get the total field. We see that it's proportional to the integral over v, the volume, where we have in the integrand we have the electron density rho times exponent i k minus i k prime times r, and then we integrate over the volume. And now we can simplify the notation slightly so that we can just uh, denote this k minus k prime to be a scattering vector, so that we can simplify our notation that we actually have. Oops, so that they they are. It's not in the in the exponent anymore. Sorry about that. Of course, like uh, I should have this this uh, capital K dot product with R inside the exponent, so that they would be here. My apologies for the mistake. And the capital K uh, is defined that it's the the K prime minus K, and it's known as the scattering vector, and that helps us with the notation. And and this is actually a useful quantity later on, as we see. So now we have a, a form for the total measured scatter field. And, and we see that it's a relatively simple looking still, and, and we see that the, in, in principle it depends on the electron density because we have that row there inside our integral. And in experiments we measure intensities so that they, they, we, we know in irradiances, and, and what we can do is that we can measure them in, in given directions that's what an X-ray diffraction instrument can, can provide for us. And we then know that this is proportional to the modulus of the scatter field, uh, modulus squared of the scattered field, and then we can uh, insert the, the form that we just uh, discovered for the scattered field. And then we see that the, this is actually what we would measure in the experiments. And what this tells to us, that if we are pro able to measure the intensity of our scatter field in this given direction, k prime, then in principle we can get information of the role. And that's the, the, the point here to make. For most electrons, uh, for, for, for most elements, the, the electrons are close to the atomic cores. And, and, and this is especially true when we are looking at heavier elements. And, and then we have a lot of core electrons. And then these core electrons are actually quite close to the atomic cores, and there's only a few valence electrons that are not that that close to the, the atoms and the nucleus. And, and this means then that this raw electron density 
is, is quite directly linked to the arrangement of the ionic cores. And, and this means that it provides information of the lattice structure. And, and, and this is okay as long as we are still dealing with the, the not the lightest of elements. Because then we do have core electrons uh, in, in great numbers. And then the core electrons, because they are close to the atomic nuclei, then we get information of where the atomic nuclei actually are, and not, not, not where the valence electrons are. The problem we still face here is that the, the integration over the whole volume of a sample V is quite difficult. So, so we need, need take a use of, of some kind of simplification or, or a neat trick that uh, we, we could do the integration. And, and this is where we start taking use of the periodicity of our crystal or our solid in question. And, and this is what we will do next. So we have an integral over the whole sample volume because that's where the signal is coming from. And, and in principle, there's an awfully many, many of electrons, like already a single cubic centimeter of a piece of a solid. We'll have uh, an atoms of the order of an Avogadro number, so then the power of 23 and then even more so of electrons, so the, 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 the problem would be quite complicated. So how do we solve that issue? Is that the, we, we now start using the periodicity of the crystal. And this is what we will do next. And, and this is why we need to go yet another detour on our treatment, because how can we take use of the periodicity of the solid? Is that now in practice we must introduce to you the, the infamous reciprocal lattice, and, and then, then take use of this, this mathematics to get forward. So this is what we will now do next. So the reciprocal lattice, the, the, this concept, even though it's very abstract, it's very fundamental and, and very important in solid state physics. And, and why it's important is that the first of all, like we just concluded in our previous slides, is that the, it can ease up our treatment of periodic problems. And we just encountered such a problem when we wanted to understand X-ray diffraction from a piece of a solid. And, and this is where reciprocal lattice will help. In essence, mathematically, it means that we, we start making Fourier transforms of our functions and quantities and inverse Fourier transforms. And, and because we have a periodic material, then we take use of the properties that are associated with periodic functions, and then we get forward. The downside, the cause that we must pay is that the, it might be a little bit abstract in the beginning, this concept, and it might be difficult to understand. And, and I, I suggest that the remedy to use here is that the, you just need to repeat of these concepts, maybe read things from a different uh, book, uh, talk with your fellow students and talk with me and, and kind of like in a small piece at a time, like start constructing this, this whole, whole maze of knowledge in your own mind so that you understand what happens. So repetition here, I think, will be necessary. And, and uh, if, if you pay enough attention, I'm sure you will get these concepts. In the end, they are not overly complicated. It's just that they, they, it's a little bit abstract and, and you, you probably want to memorize some equations that we are about to uncover so that they, you then see when we are using them that where they come from. So we start by just introducing the mathematical definitions of, of this reciprocal lattice and the reciprocal lattice vectors and then that, that's how we proceed. And then later on, we then continue uh, on X-ray diffraction and apply these tools to, to solving that problem. And maybe like uh, in this repetition path, maybe you can, for example, search things from an internet and maybe you can use some talkative AI to kind of like uh, verify to yourself what are these concepts and, and what are their potential meanings. But I must warn you, the AIs, they're very confident on, on their saying, so it might be that they, you, you, you might get misled, misled by, by such a trial, but maybe maybe it's worthwhile to try out. I, I don't know. I haven't tried it myself, but maybe I should. Maybe we should have a discussion exercise like based on this. 
kind of like uh, ask an AI a question and then uh, like decipher the answer that doesn't make sense or not. So, uh, <clears throat> like in in the first lecture, we, we discovered that a Brava lattice, which is a periodic lattice, was given by by this capital R a, a lattice vector, and this capital R was defined as an, an, an integer n times a generating vector a i plus an integer n times a generating vector a2 plus o another integer times generating vector a3 so m n and o are integers here and these a i's are lattice vectors or generating lattice vectors to be more specific because often we say this capital r is a lattice vector they all are but maybe it's 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 good to distinguish be distinguish the difference between uh, small a's uh, and ai's and, and the, the capital r here and what we are now doing is that the, we, we, we want to find a vector G, and, and this will be our reciprocal vector that kind of dis defines a, a similar lattice as what the capital R does, but now the lattice is, is what we call the reciprocal space, reciprocal lattice. And, and this is actually very useful, and it's very abstract, but let's just start with the math. So we, we are seeking for this vector G, and, and how do we seek it? What kind of properties we, we insist G of having is that they, uh, it must be a conjugate of capital R. And how do we un ensure that G, our arbitrary vectors right now, is a, a conjugate? Is that we enforce, inform this condition that exponent i G times R must be unity. So this is the first property, or I would say definition, that they, they, we have for the reciprocal vector G. And, and uh, looking at the properties of an exponent, we, we see that the, the argument inside the exponent is equivalent to the condition that the uh, G times R must be an integer of 2 pi. So uh, basically it must be in a 2 pi L, where L is another integer. So these, these two conditions are actually equivalent, and, and, and these will be used all the time when we're dealing with the math uh, regarding periodic functions. So we use these a lot. I, I must warn you, memorize them already, and uh, then we are using. Then when we are using them, you see where they come from. So the, this uh, like a, is a kind of classical example of Chekhov's gun that uh, something that we will forget for a short while. But this will come and hunt us down later after a few few lectures has passed. So these are the properties that they, we are using all the time. So please memorize them because we will be using them. And then if you don't remember them, you think that this is so difficult, this solid state physics and, and, and reciprocal lattice vectors and reciprocal lattice, because you just don't remember these relatively simple equations. Okay. Let's get forward. Uh, reciprocal vector G, we can also write it in exactly the same kind of form as the capital R. So we can write G to be a integer M prime times another a generating vector B1 plus N prime times another generating vector B2 and similarly O prime times another generating vector B3, where M prime, N prime and O prime are integers. And, you, and sh as you can see, this form is exactly the same as with the capital R, a normal lattice vector. And of course, this must be the case. We are dealing with a three-dimensional vector space. So of course, we must be able to describe a vector inside that space with this kind of uh, notation. And, and these uh, bi's are now similar quantities. They are the, as, as the a, ai's. So they are generating vectors of this reciprocal space. And in practice, these, these bi's can be found to be of form that the, the B, uh, b1 equals 2 pi times the cross product of a2 and a3 divided by the scalar uh, triple product of a1 dot product inside a cross product of a2 and a3. Similarly, these are actually like uh, related with a cyclic permutation. So B2 is of the form that we have 2 pi times 
a fraction where on the top side we have a cross product between the A3 and A1 and on the underneath we have A1 dot A2 cross A3 term. So another scalar triple product, the, the uh, oriented uh, volume of a parallel pipe and, and, and so forth. Incidentally, like uh, this uh, looks like a scalar, but actually, like uh, this is a pseudo scalar due to the fact that we have the cross product here. So that the, uh, if you're interested about the symmetry properties of a lattice, try try uh, imagining a lattice where all of these are pointing in different directions, not in orthogonal directions, and they have different lengths. Then you actually have a lattice that lacks inversion symmetry. And then you can actually have a two kind of very similar lattices when, when you perform an inversion uh, operation. But they are not exactly the same lattices. So they, they are actually handed, the lattices. There's two configurations. The other one is left-handed uh, configuration and the other one is right-handed configuration. And, and because we have had this physical difference in the lattices, we must also have a similar kind of physical, or sorry, mathematical difference in the, in the math. And, and when we are calculating the volume, in fact, this, this, this scalar triple product we are using to calculate the volume, this is actually not a normal scalar, but it's actually a pseudo scalar. So depending on the, on the kind of handedness of our configuration, it might either have a plus sign or minus sign. And, and then this plus or minus means that they, do we have this, this inversion symmetry or not. So if we may lack the inversion symmetry, then we may also have a minus sign there. But just a kind of like peculiar uh, fun fact regarding the mathematics, because when we are dealing with cross products, things become somehow like a, sometimes a little bit complicated. And, and then I, I find it very intriguing and interesting that, they, of course, all the math that we use to describe physics describe the, the, our reality we are seeing, then of course they, they, they must be compatible with each other. So whatever we see in the nature, then then for sure we will see something similar in mathematics and, and they must be compatible. That of course they, they, they must be, be behaving the same way. And then, okay, back to on trail. So B3, the, the reciprocal generating vector of the third one is of the form 2 pi times the, the, the similar quantities as in before. So please note that these indices 1, 2, and 3 in these three equations, they vary through a cyclic permutation. So it's entirely enough to just like a, remember a formula where we have I here, we have J here instead of 2s, and we have K here instead of A3. And so this is I, J, K, and when we want to calculate what is the, the B2, the reciprocal lattice vector B2, we just cyclically permute the indices, and, and that's that's how we get the other, other equations. So it's just enough to remember that these, these indices are related to cyclic permutation, and remember just a single equation, and that's, that's enough. This, of course, looks these, these formulas for the reciprocal lattice vectors, the generating lattice vectors, they look awful. But, but this is a kind of like a notation. This is a, the way, way of choosing uh, uh, these reciprocal lattice vectors that ensures that then this G reciprocal lattice vectors has the, the quantities, the properties of the previous slide. So when we multiply G with capital R, and, and we get always 2 pi times an integer L. So this, this, this is the necessary condition for that. Nothing less and nothing more. And what this means in practice, from these definitions we have covered, like a, we get this very highly useful identity, and, and this will be of the form that when we take a generating vector AI, and we calculate the dot product with a reciprocal generating vector BJ, this equals to 2 pi times delta function, uh, Kronecker delta ij. So only when, when the i's and j's are the same, this is non-zero, this, this dot product. And it, in fact, it's equal to 2 pi. 
Another useful property is that the, we have this equality that we may take exponent i in g times r, small r, and this is equal to the case we can always uh, multiply this with this, this uh, exponent i g times capital R because this was equal to 1, remember, like uh, this was what we defined earlier, that this, this must always be equal to unity. And then we can combine terms and we see that in fact uh, exponent i g r is equal to exponent i g small r plus r. So in fact we see that this kind of phase term that we have here is always equal to here. So that we, we see that there's this kind of like a periodicity with respect to this capital R. And, and this of course makes sense because we, we, we want to deal with lattices that are periodic with respect to this capital R. We, we want to be able to describe periodic structures where different R's are exactly in an equivalent position, like in, in terms of what happens. So this is nice. Like we already see that we, we have some, some kind of useful properties for, for, for this G reciprocal lattice vector. And interestingly enough, the reciprocal vector G in, in the form when we have I times B1 plus J times B2 plus K times B3, this is actually a perpendicular to the plane defined by the Miller indices I, J, K. So now we see that uh, when we are dealing with this specific reciprocal lattice vector, we, we can directly connect that with the Miller indices i, j, k. And, and this is very important when we are proceeding with our general diffraction theory. Because we will be using this reciprocal vector g in our mathematical formulation. And now whenever we are seeing this g there in our piece of math, we see right away that this is actually, in fact, we are speaking physically of different Miller indices. So, for example, if something would peak in, in the diffra diffraction experiment with a specific G value, for example, I would be 1, J would be 2, and K would be 3 value, we would know that this peak corresponds to these Miller indices 1, 2, 3, and this already we have known, that we know that they, this corresponds to a very physical plane in our periodic lattice. So this is the kind of thing to consider and, and pay attention here. So G is related to the Miller indices. And now we're ready to proceed in our uh, treatment regarding the, the X-ray diffraction. And, and, and in there, what we must first do is that the, we must kind of succumb more into the meaning of the reciprocal lattice, that the, what this really means in terms of the functions that they we're dealing with. So what we do for here is that the, we realize that this reciprocal lattice, this concept, really allows us to treat lattice periodic functions. And, and now we will go forward what this mathematically means. But physically, what a lattice periodic function means is that, the, for example, if I uh, have my periodic structure and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand how a single electron behaves, and since it's a periodic structure, like uh, the, the electron must behave the same way nearby each of those, those atomic ions. So we, we cannot really distinguish between, between the different electrons where they are with respect to a given, given lattice point. So th there's this, this, this periodicity we have in the, in the lattice. So this means that, for example, this electron density, rho r, this is also having these specific properties, so that it's a lattice periodic function. So meaning that when we have a rho, we know the value of rho in this small r position. When we, we move into a position r plus capital R, we know that it must be equal to the original electron density, because lattice, lattice is, is periodic. And, and this is very nice, so that the, the reciprocal lattice vectors and the concept of reciprocal lattice allows us to treat these kind of functions very conveniently. And, and what this means mathematically is that they, we are just basically taking use of the Fourier transforms. So that, that's what we're going to do mathematically. For conceptual cl 
clarity, ease of mind, we, we start by treatment of a one-dimensional situation, so one-dimensional lattice. And, and what this gives us, that instead of vectors, we can take use of scalars, and, and surely this, this helps our, our treatment for now. And in the end, we will generalize to three-dimensional three cases. So we start by defining our lattice period, and now since we have a one-dimensional case, we can just use a single number. So we used A to be our lattice constant, and then we have a lattice periodic electron density, and what this means is that we assume that the electron density rho x, and now we are just not using r but just x as a variable here, this must be equal to rho in a position of x plus a. So this is the, the kind of defining equation, defining condition of a lattice periodic electron density. And, and this is something we should remember that uh, we will be using these kind of equalities all the time when we are dealing with lattice periodic functions. The nice thing about periodicity is that uh, we can take use of a Fourier series description and, and we can describe this, this electron density rho x quite conveniently using Fourier series. So we can describe that to be a constant c and then we sum over terms where n extends from 1 to infinity and we have a constant cn multiplying a cosine of x times 2 times time n divided by a wherever n is the, the rolling index of the summation and plus sn times sine of a similar looking term. So these constants c, cn and sn they will be like a figure out in the future. They are not yet of our interest. But we know that this is a description of my function. And this is quite convenient when we have a lattice periodic function because like uh, in the only specific terms inside the summation like matter are non-zero. And now we will turn this into an exponent notation. So just re recalling the, the Euler's formula that the, the cosine x plus i times sine x equals to exponent i x. We can really write the, the below earlier Fourier series description in a complex notation. So the electron density rho x is then just a summation. And now we extend the summation of the index n from minus infinity to infinity. And then we have the rho n. The, the coefficient, Fourier coefficient of the electron density times exponent i n 2 pi x divided by the lattice constant a. So these terms rho n are the Fourier coefficients and, and they can be calculated simple by just taking the inverse Fourier transform of our uh, rho density. Sorry, uh, electron density rho. So rho n, that's basically calculated by 1 over a and then we integrate from 0 to a the, in the integrand we have the electron density rho x and then we have the exponent minus x uh, in two, uh, sorry h 2 pi divided by a this should be this h should be n there sorry i have a mistake so I, i'm calculating a coefficient rho n so surely i must have n here and not an h sorry about the typo so this is a way how do I calculate each of those Fourier coefficients and, and I can do that and or my computer can do it even better and then this would allow me to describe the, the general electron density as a Fourier series description. And then from the experiments what we know is that the, the electrons they are also real valued quantities so the electron density is a real valued quantity either an electron is, is in a position or not or, or we have a density, but the, 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 that quantity of being imaginary like doesn't tell me anything. So that, they, that that's wrong physically. So that gives us a restriction on Fourier coefficients. So if I take the complex conjugate of a rho minus n, I know that that must be equal to rho n. And, and this is how I ensure that the final electron density rho x is real valued quantity. And now uh, I will verify, I will verify, and uh, we will verify that uh, this, this rho x we have now discovered is a lattice periodic function. 
And, and uh, how do we do is that we ensure that this row x plus a must be equal to row x. And, and I just mindlessly place into our previous equation instead of x, a x plus i. So in the exponent I now have instead of x, I have x plus i. And then I reshuffle terms and, and I will take use of the properties of the reciprocal lattice vector and I will get what we seek. So we now just take out the x and an a's, they separated, and we have two exponents now that they mean in our summation. I will just write this in a slightly different. So the, what I have now in the, the kind of latter term, we have a divided by a, so we can get, get them away, and we have this kind of exponent now left. So we have exponent i n times 2 pi. And, and, and I know, like already from the definition of the reciprocal lattice vector and also from the kind of like the way the math works, I have integer of 2 pi here in the exponent. I know that this must be 1 for every integer of n. This is how it works out. Like maybe it helps for you to, to think that this, this guy here draws a unit circle in the complex plane. And, and when I'm having a integers in here n, like I'm always rotating a multiple of 2n in there, and, and then we know that it must be always unity. And then this gives us a fact that what we are left is that we have a summation when we have a our summing ends from minus infinity to infinity, and, and we have exponent ixn to pi divided by a here. And then by definition, this is equal to my original electron density in position of x. So what we discovered, and, and this was simple mathematics, is that the, we have equality, rho x plus a equals rho x, and this means that our uh, electron density rho is a lattice periodic function, and a is the period of our lattice. We can simplify the notation slightly further by just using a one-dimensional reciprocal lattice vector, and I'm sorry, I'm saying a vector here. It's of course a scalar, but but physically, when we generalize the 3D case, this would be a vector. So that's why I, I prefer to call a wave vector in 1D also a wave vector. Also, it's a although it's a scalar because because like the, the kind of semantic, the, the physical meaning is that in 3D case it will be a vector. So G is defined to be n times 2 pi divided by a. So this is the way we can, can use, define a reciprocal lattice vector in this 1D case. And G in advance, we, we call that a, a reciprocal lattice vector. So uh, this is how, how we could simplify our notation. So for example, we have this, this n to pi over a here, so we could just replace that with a G and, and so forth. It would make our notation slightly easier in the and then we see that we are also connecting this, this lattice periodicity with, with, the, with the concept of reciprocal lattice. So we, we verify this, <coughs> that, and, that the, and we verify that this, this G, which is defined, that it is a reciprocal lattice vector, and, and we verify that by checking that the exponent IGR equals 1 for every Bravais lattice vector we can imagine. So essentially in 1D, this, this uh, Brava lattice vector, capital R, is just a scalar. So it's R times MA. A is the lattice constant and MA is an integer. And, and how do we do this? Is that we verify that this guy must be unity. So exponent IG times R. And now in a one-dimensional case, capital G vector is now our scalar G. And then the, the capital R vector is now R. And, and we place what we have discovered, what's the form. So capital R equals MA, and, and we are left in the exponent is a GMA, and then we, we make the replacement for the G, and we have an equality G equals N times 2 pi divided by A, and, and we have this kind of uh, exponent now. We can see that we have two, a, two A's there, like A and divided by A, so we can get rid of them, and we are left with exponent i n m times 2 pi. And, and uh, here we have an integer multiplying an integer. We know that this guy is also 
an integer so that this must always be unity and we are now have verified that the, the, the kind of property we insist of our reciprocal lattice vectors to have is being fulfilled with this choice for a small g. And we can further simplify the notation and this is very really useful when we go to the 3D case that the indexing in the summation we, we go from n to the g. So of course things change just a little bit but in, in practice this, help, this helps us in the future. So row x we can describe that to be a Fourier series description so we sum g's from minus infinity to infinity and then we have a Fourier coefficient rho g and then we have exponent igx. And this is now a formula like even maybe I can memorize. So this is nice. So it's useful. And it's very useful. It's so useful. Oh my god. Yeah. <clears throat> so finally we generalize our one-dimensional treatment to 3D case. And this is essentially that the, now we require that uh, we have instead of x, we have a r there inside the argument of a row. And we must insist that the electron density at a point R must be equal to electron density at point R plus capital R. And this must always hold wherever this R is any, any of the Bravais lattice vectors of the lattice. So basically we would just insist that, that this electron density capital, uh, sorry, electron density rho R is a lattice periodic function. This is what we must insist next. And now, like uh, what we have, we would just put things together to kind of like a recap on the equations so that we have found the form for the electron density rho. And, and this is a lattice periodic function. And, and because of that, it's very convenient to describe the electron density rho as a Fourier series. And it will be of the form that we have rho r. And, and we are summing over the g. And please note, we now have a vector as our uh, uh, summation index. And, and we have the Fourier coefficients. Here also, please note, we have actually in fact a vector inside in the, the label. And then we have exponent g r inside. So g's, these are the reciprocal lattice vectors. And, and please note that the sum over g that we are performing and, and what kind of index we actually have in the row g. Uh, I mean, like uh, this guy here, this is actually a vector, not a scalar index. Uh, please note that the, this g is actually like a three indices. So that the, the summation actually is, is three summations. So we have summation over integers n prime, n prime and o prime in principle. So please remember this definition. But it's so much more convenient to just use a single summation and just use a vector as our uh, uh, dummy index of summation than, than writing three kind of uh, summations and, and then also describing this, this uh, Fourier coefficient g as a kind of like m prime, n prime and o prime uh, scalar. So this is the kind of uh, notational trickiness we have here, but please, please be okay with it and learn to embrace it, in fact. And if you want to really calculate the Fourier coefficients, your computer or even your mobile phone can do it for you. And, and these are then given by, by the kind of like integral where we integrate over the, the unit cell volume. So we have one over V cell, this is the unit cell volume and integrate volume of our charge density rho r and then we have the exponent minus igr there inside the integrand. So this is the way how do we then extract the Fourier coefficients and, and, and that's how do we like find out what is the Fourier description of our lattice periodic charge density. So I think I will stop this second part of our chapter 1.3 now it's over like a one hour has passed and in the in the kind of final part we will start using this and, and combining this more more carefully with the actual experiments 
that we are doing when we are performing X-ray experiments. But more of that in the upcoming lecture. Thanks for listening to me so far, and, and I wish you a great day. Bye-bye.